to take it back to the movie, you're gonna you're gonna have to find the community somehow, right? No matter what services you're on, no matter what you do, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're on Netflix, it's going to need to find its community somehow. You just kind of yeah, the more that's niche still got to be the goal, right? Is yeah, you, you got to find the people who are passionate about the thing. And the people who aren't, because you're never going to win with the people who don't care. The casual media consumers who binge everything all the time mm -hmm. and are happy with the, with an algorithm continuing to throw music at them all day like it's a background wallpaper, they're never going to care. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. They have lives. Yeah. They have other things yeah. going on. They're not, right. they, don't, they don't care. It's you know? the market. And, you, and, and you can't judge them for it. And you also can't change their mind. Uh, it's, it's, no. I personally love your movie. I've watched it. It's real good. Everybody else should watch it. I feel it. like Did I feel I? like I captured, or I tried to capture, and I feel like we did a good job of capturing the DIY spirit of what Nuclear Gopher represented by creating a film that was DIY in the spirit of Nuclear Gopher, um, through and through. I, I, I agree completely, and that's actually why I enjoyed it so much. It's not just it's it's like the way you did it, the way you made this movie was the way. It's the process by which I enjoy, like when you, when you came onto our place and we filmed that live music day, mm -hmm. it was, here's a building, <laughs> let's make it, let's make it into a, a movie set for the day. You're right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let's just clear it out. Let's, let's, let's cut a hole in the wall because <laughs> it's too hot and we'll roll an air conditioner in and we'll turn this into a film set for the day. And we'll do the thing. Mm -hmm. And by the end of it, we session. were all like on cloud nine. Right. Yeah. It was what we, we didn't did even know the we songs. Were we didn't even. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, that's just what you scene... do. You just get together and you do the thing. There's a scene in the opening of the movie where like, I'm looking into the window and Cindy's like playing guitar and everyone's nodding. And she's, and then she nods like, okay, you got the three chords or the five chords or whatever. And like, <laughs> okay, we're doing this. Like yeah. that was that was exactly the real yep. moment of people learning that song for the first time, and then it's in the film, everyone playing like rock gods. It was. Yeah, and I, I absolutely love that. It's so crazy. That's how we. <laughs> that, I gotta tell you, though, like that came from. That is literally how we used to. I mean, that, that's how me and Rhett used to work. Okay, we would go, we'd get up, get up in the morning, and I'd have a song in my head, and I'd be like, oh. I should write this down. So I'd write down some stuff and I would play it in my head all day and I would think think of the song and I would listen to the song fully formed in my head. And then I would come home at the end of the day, we would get home from school. I mean, this is like high school, middle school, right? We'd get home from school and I'd be like, hey, Rhett, I wrote a song this morning. And be like, okay. And by that night, that was recorded. That was done. Like we, we would just go... And I would play him some chords and he would say, oh, okay, how about this? And then he would drum some stuff and then we would just hit play or hit record. Mm -hmm. We didn't rehearse. We didn't learn it. We didn't, we didn't workshop it on stage. We didn't, I mean, like nothing. And we would just, it was just a fully beautiful, creative, collaborative process. And then it would get recorded and then we would move on. We'd do the same thing again a couple days later. And I don't know how to play most of those songs because they were they were one time moment in time things mm -hmm. and and so you gain some confidence when you work like that you gain the confidence that if you get the people together and you all have the you'll same sort of spiritual cool. intention then you'll you'll create something and you just you just it's like a fucking trust fall with the universe you're just right. like oh we're just gonna do this and it's gonna be fine like you guys were coming out from like another state and you brought film gear and everything. And we didn't do you the courtesy of getting together and meeting each other and practicing first. Mm -hmm. I didn't even clear out the fucking barn. You just showed up and we made it happen. We have to roll That was a pure nuclear locks. gopher moment. Right? Yeah. I, I love that in the movie. I love that. <laughs> I'm so glad that that made it in. It made me very but happy. I Like that morning, I was like, this is what we're going to try to do. I was telling Ryan and I were like, head to head like yeah. he's like what is actually going on i'm like this is my dream my dream is that we go to ryan's house we, we saw that building earlier this week i think i think we'd been there once before like to yeah yeah you scoped it out yeah we scoped it out and then i was like i think if we like clear out that building we can make a we make we like film the bands playing there he's like why don't we just play in the basement where he has all of his instruments already set up and in like his library or whatever and i was like it's just not a very inspiring basement i'm not 
being mean. <laughs> it's just like for a concert, it just no, it's not. like a concert. And I was like, I think we need to go into like a big open space and then just like, I feel like it'll all come together. And telling you that, telling Eric and Cindy that, telling Chad that, Chad's like, this is never going to happen without a drummer. And I think I got a drummer who could like, who could like step up and like learn all these songs on the spot. And so he pulls in Cam. And like the fact that that all came together, especially with your wife, like having the lawnmower breakdown, I was like, I can't, like everything, <laughs> I <forgot about> that. <laughs> everything that I'm trying to do <laughs> she, is like so on the edge of failure. And now we have to rescue this lawnmower. <laughs> like, you guys it was stuck between those two birch trees. I forgot. Oh my god. I was like, that I was cannot awesome. believe that it might be a lawnmower that ruins my my like black <laughs> moment that is gonna make this film work. And then I was like, okay, okay, we have to spend 20 minutes doing this thing. And then we rescued the lawnmower and everyone's back on and we like we got into the zone again and then it was, we were like actually made it happen. It, uh -huh. was, amazing. it was amazing. <laughs> yeah i i i i forgot about the one that was that was that was such a fun day man yeah it was such a fun day and and i it was so perfect i mean it really was it was exact even the lawnmower getting stuck between the birch trees yeah that all um, makes it special which for anybody listening <laughs> this is like a ride this is a ride on top zero turn giant ass lawnmower that weighs like eight bazillion pounds and it's we had massive. to rescue it because it was <laughs> like crammed so between two trees it's like going up <laughs> and like it weaseled itself between two trees like going trying to go up but falling back down in like some dirt and mud i still don't totally understand how she got it stuck that way but it was fine <laughs> Um, but I just, just the whole like, uh, roll with it, baby kind of approach is it, it was, you captured it so well. It was, yeah. you know, that was fun. I want to do it again with even yeah, less planning next time. <laughs> I'm going to try to plan more. You can plan less. I'll plan more. <laughs> um, so being, being I'm back. all about spontaneity, man. It's all about the spontaneity. You're good capture spontaneity. the energy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a couple of things I want to I'm say just about, bad at planning. about the film that I haven't said yet is that um, I'm, today, the day of the recording of this, which is mid-February, mid um, the official trailer of the film is complete and finished. And um, I'm very excited about that. It, it looks great. It sounds great. And it captures the essence of the film really well. Um, I have a poster being made. Uh, there's an ex-Jehovah's Witness artist who I've been following in Australia who paints and what she paints is amazing. So like I had her paint and you, I think, I don't know if you paid attention to the, we have a group on Facebook that you're a part of, um, but it's a painting of you, but it's, it's what I did is I combined, I, I found a picture that Jehovah's Witnesses have on their website and this might just like scream plagiarism or like copyright infringement, but I, I took, it was an, insp it's a painting, but it's an inspiration from a photograph where there's like a, a young guy, um, early 20s, who's got a Bible, and he's at someone's door, and he's like holding the Bible, and he's like pointing at it. Um, okay. so I took that, and I took a similar age, your head, from a photograph, and uh, the painter uh, <laughs> painted your head on this dude's body. And then, um, uh, and this is my idea, like I, I was like going through like seven different ideas, and a couple friends were helping here in LA, um, to come up with an idea to convey the film well in image, in a single image. And so what I came up with was like, you are like doing this Jehovah's Witness thing with the Bible, but you're standing on a guitar and the guitar is like a pathway that goes into infinity. And um, I think I saw an early, early draft of this, but I have not seen how this is okay. going to come together. So, so I, I knew you talked about this concept a while ago. Yeah. And I had a bunch of really crude whiteboard drawings of like my idea. <laughs> so I sent it I to this like, artist. I was like, oh, if XKCD made this. This is, this is what it would look like. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so I gave this artist and she's like, I love that concept. Let's, let's do it. And she gave me a low, a low ex Jehovah's witness, like we're buddies price and uh, commissioned her to paint you in this um, exotic world with like a psychedelic super like tunnel background. Um, and she did, and it looks great. So I'm really excited to share that with the world. So that's coming wow. out. Wow. So I need to take a picture of this painting. So I have a, I have a painting. It's probably like, a, I don't know, three by two foot painting that it will be in my house for a while, but one day it might be in your house. We'll see what happens. <laughs> but oh my God, I got to see this. Put yourself in my shoes, Scott. Somebody goes and does this about your life. How weird <laughs> would that be? 
it's super weird yeah so that's why like you should own the picture <laughs> someday, maybe. Uh, i was like can i can i have this picture of this guy like i barely know like painting of a guy uh in my house forever but anyway i'm having a real have a real painting commissioned of you when you're like 20. that's a beautiful thing i'm <laughs> i'm honored i wish i was 20 again actually no <laughs> that was a really shitty time it's funny like you, you coming back around on this stuff just for the timeline purposes, like you were talking about, you know, how I was this notorious apostate and everything. That was 2004. That was <laughs> like 17 ago. years ago. Right. The whole and, lifetime has and my life moved on from there. Right. Yeah. yeah. And like, I, 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 I moved on. I got a life. I don't spend all my time on ex-witness things. I, but I never stopped doing the music stuff, obviously, mm -hmm. but it's very um, surreal to have this sort of thing happening all these years later about this period of time that to me, and this is why to me, your movie is so valuable to me. And I think it's good to have capture this on the podcast here. Um, it takes something that matters a lot to me and mattered a lot to a lot of people I care about. And it immortalizes it in a way that um i felt feel is very respectful of what we were doing and very respectful of who we were and why we were doing what we were doing and despite the fact that some people are not going to like it because it does also talk about the fallout from leaving the watchtower society and all that um i think that it's it means a lot to me that you took the time to get to know me get to know you know, you already knew Eric um, and, and, and Ivy and, and uh, to bring in James and Chad and all that. And like to, I was willing to open up all the material I had, all the archive of all the stuff that I had, because I trusted you to be able to do something. If you did anything at all with it, which again, I wasn't always sure was going to happen because you know how people are sometimes they mm -hmm. get an idea, but it never actually it's a, happens. It's a really big um, project. Yeah. But the fact yeah, it was ambitious, right? Like, and, but for, I knew that you as a person, from what I could tell of you, that if you were entrusted with it, you would do the right thing. And you did. And I feel really good about that. Like, I've had many conversations where I've gone to Esther and I've been like, I find it both humbling and um, amazing that Scott has taken the time and the effort to make this thing because. I feel like if nothing else, if, if, if nothing, I don't care about anything financially happening. I'm good on that. I got a career. Everything's fine. And I'm going to keep making music when I want to make music for the reasons I want to make music. Um, but to have such a really like vital and important part of your life sort of collated, collected and used to tell a story and uh, treated with like, you know, respect and with, with, with enthusiasm is just, it's just, it's, it's wonderful. So, you know, I'm just, I really appreciate it a lot. I, I really do. It, it means a lot to me that you did it. And um, I hope everybody watches it and I hope they watch it and they, they think it's, it's good. And I, um, I'm terrified of the idea of, you know, my uh, younger, thinner self with hair up against my current self. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in terms of how I look on a screen but I mean I just you know I did what I did for the reasons I did it with no ex expectation that it would ever have any payoff for anybody other than me and it's it's very validating for uh for myself at least that that it mattered to somebody else enough to to do this project so you know Long-winded way of saying thank you for doing it. I really appreciate it, and I, I, I love the result. It makes it. I've showed it to some friends who have like come back and been like, "I cried after I watched this. This was amazing." And uh, you know, they're like, "I feel like I know you better. I've known you for for ten years, but I feel like I know you better now that I saw this." Mm. And because I don't, most people who know me today do not know that any of that ever happened. Right. They don't know me as a Jehovah's Witness. They don't know me as a musician. They don't know me as a guy who ran some weird underground record label for you know, all those years. Um, 
that's just a different that's a right. different ryan i'm the director of engineering at an employment compliance company you know <laughs> uh, and and i do i do what i do in my basement for my own amusement but it's just really cool so happy to hear all that all. i'm just i mean i mean it, it I, means a lot to me i'm glad to hear that and I'm, I'm, it was really important to me from the beginning to have your buy-in and not just you but you eric cindy chad and and james like james also gave up like they all gave their music and then james also gave like all of the films that he ever made to the project for like archival yeah. footage which is what makes it a documentary without james's footage i wouldn't have been able to make a documentary i could have made a storytelling piece with like not much maybe some modern footage to go with your your interviews but i have this like mm -hmm. beautiful body of like amazing videos to go with it too that were fun and vibrant and really helped tell the story i think um so getting getting your like your access to all the archival audio and then james's access to all the archival video um was amazing and and for me like the big motivation for me was that like i had a very similar life but i was kind of doing I was sort of like DIYing it on my own. Like imagine like any one of the few, the many bands that were part of Nuclear Gopher, I was just part of another band that you guys just didn't know about. And I was like a few hours away mm -hmm. and I didn't know about you guys. Um, when I discovered Nuclear Gopher, it was at the height of Nuclear Gophers and, and like all the different bands and the festivals that were happening in New October Ridge um, and shows between Minneapolis, Chicago and Madison. And like, that was mm -hmm. so cool to like discover that it made me actually like stay in the religion. I was like, oh, there's actually really cool people in this religion. I had no idea, you know. Um, so like to be able to meet, not 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 just me, but like I knew I knew Eric, Cindy, and Chad, and and uh, but like to be able to tell a story that related to my story of being in a band and being in this religion and the challenges that that presented. Like my band went. Through, I was I wrote a blog recently just to like kind of go through the. Um, wrote a blog post about going through the process of being in a band and like the problems of being a band that's in this religion. Cause I was in a band, not in the religion. I was in the band in, in my hometown with my hometown friends, high school friends. And that was easy. Like mm -hmm. I was the slacker in that band. I was like barely showing up, barely practicing. And like, um, we recorded an album and like we toured around and played a bunch of bars. But I, then I was like, well, I can't do that anymore because we got, we, all of our elders got fired. So we got a bunch of new elders and they're not happy with me being in a, a, a worldly band, a normal band. I can't do all the things so like mm -hmm. i'll just i'll just quit that band and i'll just like form my own band because i have my own songs but then like a year within within the first year like the guitarist got disfellowshipped for some reason i don't remember why and it was like a big problem to have him in the band so like he had to go we had to kick him out like that that's not great like you can't have a mm -hmm. band where people can get deleted by someone else like bands have a hard enough time staying together with their own trauma and problems or like in yeah. fighting or whatever and then we got, you know, another person to play guitar and then, then the bassist had a problem. And then like the bassist had to change because they had a problem. Like they weren't like going to meetings anymore. And it was like, you can't have a band where people are deleted by someone else. And it's like, they can't, should, no one should be able to control the band outside of the band themselves. And like to see like, okay, there's this whole movement in Minneapolis and Chicago and Madison where there's an incredible scene that's like growing and vibrant. Everyone's going to each other's shows and supportive. And like, it was like having all those same struggles that I went through. I was like, okay, I can tell my story of not only like being in the music scene in the religion, but also like through your life and your very dramatic, traumatic moments um, dealing with like family issues that like, that's what's like the burning fire as well. Because like, I don't have my relationship with my family. So like my parents, my grandparents, my two brothers, my two little sisters, um have all like disowned me i guess or whatever you know like the classic shunning situation so like your situation yeah. is like a little bit more intense version of what i went through um with a lot of the same elements and so i was like okay amazing first interview <laughs> down this path with you i was like uh there's a movie here like the backbone of a movie i was already <laughs> recorded that is so reflective of my own life that I feel like very motivated to make sure that it's told for your sake, but also, of course, my story is like in there somewhere. The, that makes sense, actually. Our life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. We have a lot of overlap in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, um, a lot of shared experience there. And then that, the that is that comes through, right? Yeah. Even that the catalyst. Through. You know, you're, 
where you started to disbelieve, like where you started to research. It was the same catalyst for me, the exact same topic. And that actually was came what from, got you out too? It probably came from you actually, because it was Eric who was like uh, embedding the seeds. And he's probably say reading that. Hira. You make it worse. <laughs> he's probably reading Hira Hira. And he's like, well, if you're questioning that, what about this? And like, okay. Yeah. yeah that's a really good question to raise. Actually, I should, I'm going to think about that. And like, the more I think about it, the more it's like, this is a serious topic. I need to do more research on it. I finally did more research on it. And I was like, okay, this is, yeah, I'm one of your Hira Hira rescue I went. situations. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, if I have to, if I have to, uh, if I have to uh, live with that, I can live with that. I like that. I'm um, very proud of that. I'm I was so that. ferociously analyzing that shit at the time. Like there was like a two, three year period where I was reading two or three books a week. I was studying everything and I was writing about it nonstop. I had this little power book, 170, that was like already over a decade old and it couldn't do anything but write. And I would take it with me on the bus. I got it for 20 bucks off like Craigslist or something. And I would take it on the bus with me and I would just, it would, it was a 45 minute commute and I would put on headphones and I would just write about whatever I had been reading about. And, uh, you know, over the last couple of days, and then I would get to work and I'd plug it in and I would upload it to live journal or WordPress or wherever I was writing at the, at that moment. And I would just, I would send it off into the world and then I would go to work and just work all day and do the thing. And I was, I had no idea anybody was reading it, visiting it, responding to it. Like there was like two years where I was writing like crazy and I was, it was crickets because I was persona non grata and nobody could talk to me, which they still can't. But then I found a, then it, then it was like after a couple of years, people started reaching out to me and being like, oh, hey, so I was reading your stuff and now I'm not a witness anymore. And Erica's one of them, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that pissed my family off. I'm not going to lie. Uh, you know, I got the, you I, it didn't help my reputation. What you were thinking because, about. Or you're yeah, you're not people. supposed to. And I, I, I think that I was writing for me. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and I was not expecting that people were reading it, but the fact is that, um, obviously people were, and more importantly was that I was doing the thing you're not supposed to do as witness, which was publicly examining what we were all taught to believe mm -hmm. and, uh, doing so without any filter. And once I worked it all out for myself, I didn't really have anything else to say anymore. So I didn't want to go into the business of spending the rest of my life writing these kinds of things and doing this kind of stuff. Um, but I, I did need to do that. Like I, I, I'm a writer by nature. I write all the time. I write every day. Mm -hmm. And 99.9% um, .9 of what I write stays on a local file share uh, inside my house. Uh, but I still write every day. And it's, it's really crazy to me that like what that almost had a bigger imp influence on the world than all the nuclear gopher stuff did because it caused a whole lot of people to um examine their beliefs and like reality it, yeah hmm. and honestly if they had written back to me and corrected me where i was wrong that was actually, that would have been great, right? I, I was looking for a reason to be a witness. I didn't mm -hmm. want to leave. Like, like you were saying, like what, you know, you saw that this whole scene existed and made you want to stay a witness. I didn't want to leave because right. I was in the middle of all of it and I knew what I would be losing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but once, once my filter was shut off, there was just no, I couldn't do anything else. I was just not even a, <laughs> it, was, it was like, it was out of my control. I had been, mm -hmm. I had been holding back my internal, uh, uh, walls, uh, for so long. And once they were gone, it was like, there was just nothing. So I'm right. glad you read it. Or even if you didn't read it, I'm glad you got it second or third hand. Mm -hmm. Um, that was good. I haven't done anything in the last 15 years, but at least I got that going for me. <laughs> yeah. For me, it was just like, it was logic. Like, let's, let's think about these things. Logic. We were, I was already doing that. Like, uh, Chad talked to me in the interview. I don't think I made it in the film, but he talked about how we were, he, him and his buddies in the music scene were, would refer to me and a few other people that I was friends with at the time in Minneapolis as the fringies because we were like willing to talk about openly, yeah. like the things we <laughs> believed or didn't believe. 
Um, uh huh. So like, there's just like everything is about logic. We we were studying the Revelation book back to that topic uh, for the third time when I was living in Minneapolis, and like we would go back to my house and then just like drink beers and wine and like hang out and talk about what we really thought about these prophecies and like, but we were like not like the Bible's false. It was like there's no way that the witnesses are right about this. The the two the two witnesses and the book or whatever. Um, yeah, the odds that that uh, that was two thousand years ago being written about the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in right. the twentieth century is a little hard to fathom. Like we we were trying to figure out what was what made sense and what didn't because there's so many things that are like so difficult to believe. There's so many hoops are jumping through to like connect certain dots that are like so, you know, the books that they're reading and trying to connect dots. Like they claim God wrote the book, but like this is written by different humans over hundreds of different years, like thousand year separation between from book to book like oh this means this and this means that that therefore like our beliefs are real and you're like no way that those people ever believed that when they wrote it and like there's just so many ways to look at it no, that just, it, just make them sound like fools but it becomes really it's almost shooting a fish in a barrel when it comes to logic when you when you look at any belief system that starts from where they want to be and then works backwards right and cherry yeah. picks things and builds a case mm -hmm. like you can build a case for anything i remember trying to work out cases, like melt pretty fast yeah i remember trying to work out like okay so witnesses believe that noah and his people survived this great deluge of the planet which definitely didn't happen definitely didn't happen when they said it did um 4500 years ago yeah so like eight people who are all related blood wise um all incestually made children and then it populated the entire planet in this amount of years like how fast would you have to mm -hmm. move across the planet like would you go by the coastline where they're floating down the river? Was it like part of their rule set? You had to like establish a new, a new like house. Like how many miles away would you have to be? I was like trying to think out like how do we spread around the world so fast and build communities all over the world um, in this short amount of time? It doesn't even make any sense to have this many millions or billions of people. And like I was like trying to work it out and like, well, it didn't happen. Like there was there wasn't a great deluge and there wasn't just eight people or whatever that survived. Like that that didn't happen then. It probably never happened. Probably there was like. Did you ever some... see? <laughs> did you ever see the computer program I wrote about that? No, I didn't. I I wrote an app to model that. Wow, and I really? The source code <laughs> online. Yeah, yeah, and I, I I documented what all my assumptions were in the um in the in a in a post on a news group, and this was you know way back then. But basically, it was on the talk that origins uh, news group. And I went through and I basically said, here's all my assumptions. My assumption are, my assumptions are that any, that with divine support, any female who is capable of being pregnant at the age that they become biologically able to bear children is essentially continually pregnant until menopause. And that they reproduce at this incredibly fecund rate, right? And, and, and where would that get us in terms of population? And I wrote a program that basically modeled it out where I had like a little person object and the person could be male or female and they could, you know, go into the pool and they, it would loop through and it would count up like how many kids and how many kids and how many kids. Eventually determined that in order to reach anything even in the neighborhood of known population density, even according to the Bible, like, but if you also factor in like other known written records of other civilizations, not only would everybody have always had to have been pregnant and no kids would have like ever died. There would have been no stillbirths. It would have been like, everybody would have lived. Um, you still wouldn't get there. And wow. you'd wind up with a population where 90% of the people were like under the age of 15 and pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it just, it, it, the world that you'd model out like from the program was not a sustainable civilization and was not even, could not account for under even the most generous circumstances, absolutely could not account for the known facts of human civilization. Like it just couldn't happen. <laughs> like, and like I started with the Watchtower Society's day. Mass death, war. Yeah. <laughs> None of that happened, right? Because because okay. God was God was like supporting the feed, process. How do you feed let all these bad children? <laughs> Crazy. I don't know who would have been doing the 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 work. Like who would have been raising the kids while who was raising the grain and who was hunting right. and who was building the cities and who was doing all like it just wouldn't 
the people weren't there. Like all and, the warriors uh, are 12 anyway, years old. Anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> Every great war that happened in the Bible was conducted entirely by teenagers, according to this model. You know, it's like it just it didn't it didn't make any sense. And I so I put the source code out there and I put it out there. It was uh, it was a post of the month on Talk Origins. Uh, uh, it's still on their website from cool. back in 2004 or whatever. And somebody even corrected it and found out that I had made a mistake in my logic, where I had actually um, given everybody like one extra month of of uh credit like th th there was a like, there was a, like a, a zero <laughs> off by one index error so the the pregnancies were only running at eight months and they're like actually if we fix this bug it's even worse you know <laughs> so um that's fine yeah i did that i actually i i, I wrote a java program for it it's the source code still out there it <laughs> sort of proves that it just could not have happened right well, among all the other evidence as if one needed math. that proof yeah but it <laughs> It was it was fun to do, you know. It was fun. It was a fun thing to do and model it out. That was during my um, obsessive time period. So, okay. So, this podcast, mm -hmm. you want to get together and chat some more. What are some of the things you'd like to talk about? I do. I, I made a short list. Let me read some of those off. So, some of the things okay. we could talk about in the future and another edition of this would be the film festival strategy I have engaged in. Um, some of the festivals that we're excited about. Actually, I'd like to read a couple of those. Let me, well, we'll get back to that. I'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah, go for it, um, go for it. The journey, some of the highs and lows of making a film and running the festival and the marketing. Um, and then uh, some of the bigger topics are like the existing market that I discovered and why I kind of thought it was like a viable idea for a film our crowdfund that we ran and how that went. This is long before I knew you actually. Um, production, like how, how we shot, organized the shooting. And we talked a little bit about that today. Um, and then the editing process, because the editing process in a documentary is like, I mean, it took, it took three years from shooting to have a finished film. And now it's just like, just the beginning of being able to share some of it with people in three years. Like, and some people are saying like, that's short, like some fast, some documentaries take five or 10 years to like shoot and come up with something, which blows my mind because technology changes so fast that like you would start out on like a film camera and then like, or like, you know, rotating some reel and now, now we're on like <laughs> K, K cameras, like the technology is insane. Um, and then uh, I joined a class. So I'm learning a lot about how film festivals work and, and that whole media space. And then what, what like, what I would do different um, it's something I want to get into because there's a lot of things I would do for my next film that I definitely didn't do for this or did differently or did kind of like as a DIY and I would like to, you know, bring in more people and then yeah, marketing and then like maybe my Jehovah's Witness life. So those are the kind of topics I want to get into, like my experience. We got into some of that with like the music scene. Um, but yeah, let me grab. I'd love to hear more about your experience. I'd love to hear more about your experience because like, like you, like you've alluded to a couple of times, we've actually only had a fairly limited number of conversations directly that's true you know um and yeah. uh we weren't together in this scene at the time even though we were we just didn't know each other mm -hmm. and i would love to hear that yeah that's so i can be your audience you can talk about uh, talk okay. about your movie that seems like a, probably better for your movie than hearing me talk about random shit off the top of my head while smoking a cigar <laughs> well actually let's wrap this up um, in terms of the formal podcast, I want to just finish with like the couple things that are news sure. or the other film. And then um, if you're up for another session, we can uh, keep going. My film festival list. Um, so I got really excited about putting this out into the world. And the big names that come up when you're a novice or just like an average person are Sundance and South by Southwest. Those two are massive, especially with South by Southwest mm -hmm. with the music. So I thought that'd be a perfect fit for the film if, if we they thought we were the right quality of film. So I... I put in a work in progress so like I gave them an early edit of the film before it was quite finished um it was still okay but you know mm -hmm. now looking at it it's like not nearly as polished but most of the story was there so they found value in the story so Sundance got it and I learned about slam dance I'd never heard of but slam dance is like the middle finger to Sundance um because it's like industry insiders industry professionals and slam dance is like the industry not industry but indie filmmakers who are like, I didn't get into Sundance, right. but I still want to screen my film and I still want to like meet other filmmakers and like collaborate and network and um, do cool new projects with other people. 
So Sun Slamdance popped up in the same week. It's in the same week or the week after Sundance. And um, it's like down the street, <laughs> which is kind of funny. <laughs> um, and actually the class I'm taking is run by the guy who founded it. So he's like, nice. he's a cool guy. His name is John Fitzgerald. So I've learned a lot from John about how film festivals work. Um, so those two film festivals did not select us. And then the most recent one that did not select us was Miami. Um, but then the ones that are coming up, so there's actually quite a list here, February and March. We got my, um, we got Beverly Hills, which I don't think we're quite a good fit for. Cinequest, I think we would really be a good fit for. They're a cool film festival. Same thing for Florida Film Festival. They're a cool regional film festival that um, would be a cool fit. Atlanta seems pretty cool. They're a little bit more industry. Um, then I've got Hong Kong International Film Festival, which is kind of a long shot, but the guy who funded our film is from Hong Kong. Like the guy, the biggest, not ever, there's a lot of current funders, but the guy who really got behind our film is an evangelical Christian who like goes out on the street and talks to Jehovah's Witnesses like every day. This is like his passion and hobby. <laughs> um, he threw thousands of dollars at the film. And so like, okay, Hong Kong kind of has like a spot, but they, I mean, the film festival people don't know that, but um, so that was a, it's a long shot in a way. They do now. They're all, they're all listening to this. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, Wisconsin <laughs> film festival is a small film festival, but I thought, you know, being from Wisconsin, I'm represented, you know, you have to be from Wisconsin or have lived there to be in it. So um, I'm hoping that they pay attention and get back to us. But they're going to let us know by February 28th. So it's coming right up. So all these are, all those Very are the cool. February festivals. And then March festival, is, there's a cool couple ones coming up. Um, Berlin Revolution Film Festival, which looks really cool. It's a new festival. It comes up March 1st. Cleveland International Film Festival is actually a really, really big festival in the documentary space. And I had no idea about that until I started doing this. Um, Docville International Documentary Film Festival. They're, they're big in the documentary space. Um, March 10th, New York City Independent. Um, also March 10th. And then Ghent Viewpoint Documentary. Ghent is in Belgium. And um, there, that'd be really I'll go. Cool. I'll go to that one. Yeah, let's I'll go, go to that, that one. That one <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like it. And then we got San Francisco International Film Festival and Seattle, in Seattle International Film Festival. So those are both really big ones in the documentary space. And San Francisco International um, Film Festival actually looks like a really cool doc fest. And uh, kind of, I would love to get into that one, but have gotten crickets from all these festivals. Um, not all of them. There's one of them got back to us, but um, yeah, I, I'm emailing them and some of them email back. And then sometimes the programmer I, I email or sometimes it's like someone who's like, working with just works at the festival and I don't really know who they are they just like respond with a generic email but they're like mm -hmm. thanks for sending in whatever thanks for sending your teaser but I'll be hitting them all up um probably tomorrow and the next day with the the new trailer that you've got to watch so uh, pretty excited about setting the trailer that, I think that trailer is gonna make some um I would like to be able to share that trailer to some folks so whenever that's online and available it'll, it'll be on very soon I will let you know and it'll be open to share with them. all right I'll be making a big push so I, I would love to have okay you. But yeah, let's let's just well, wrap it I, up. I, uh, yeah, thanks for thanks okay. for coming on. Of course, man. I mean, it's it's my pleasure. It's a lot of fun. I really want. I want to hear what people have to say about this. Me too. I'm really excited. I'm to, really looking forward to people to get big seeing traction. <clears throat> yeah, I'll probably get a little hate mail here or there, but that's okay. Yeah, that's a uh, an interesting side part of the story, huh? Is that we probably both will. <laughs> You're featured. It's, but, yeah. it's not impossible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I again, you know, you don't, you just, you just do a thing, and then you see what happens. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes you wind up. Well, it's the only place to really wind up where you don't expect. So, um, I'm glad I did what what I did to help you out as far as yeah. you know um, anything so far. And uh, I hope one or one or two of these. I would think like Seattle and, and Wisconsin specifically mm -hmm. um, would be potentially good fits. I yeah. don't know. Seems like the kinds of places. Obviously Minnesota as well because a lot of us were here. But you know there was a lot of commerce between Madison and Chicago and us mm -hmm. as well. And That's also the next St. One. Louis. Minneapolis um, St. Paul International Film Festival is April 1st. They'll get, I'll be notified. But I went to them. They actually gave me a waiver. They're like, oh, it's a Minneapolis film. That sounds cool. Like, here's, it's free entrance. So I'm um, pretty excited about that. Nice. One. I think there's a big chance with them. Um, but yeah, so. Cool. Well, let me know when it happens. Tell me when I can share the trailer out and uh, tell me when this podcast is out there. I'll pimp it. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks a lot for coming on, Ryan. Until yeah, the next one. Anytime, Scott. 
Uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. See ya.